Chapter 26 Top of the World, Ma Around this time, relations with our record label, Riker Hill, became very strange. Our managers, Bob and Lynn, were also chief operating officers at the label and were starting to act a little shady. They were segregating more than ever the two owners of the label, Michael Woke and Michael Morrison, from anything Xerox related. It was even to the point where they would tell us to make sure not to invite them to the set for filming. This struck me as odd and manipulative. Why wouldn't they want the heads of our label on set of our own TV show? It was different than when we began filming the first season and they made us keep the fact that we had our own TV show a secret. Xerox was now a huge hit and of course everyone knew about it, especially our own record label. Bob and Lynn were hiding something but I couldn't figure out what. When we began tracking Casino Logic, it got even more suspicious. Now that we were signed to a label, it was in our contract that Riker Hill would pay for the recording of our next album. Right before tracking began, Bob and Lynn told us that they wanted us to pay for the album because Riker Hill had refused. We couldn't understand how or why our label would refuse. After all, this new album is going to be promoted on the second season of our hit TV show. We were also now instructed not to have any contact whatsoever with our label. Our weekly salary checks also stopped. Years later, we found out that Riker Hill did in fact want to pay for our new album with the amount stated in our contract. Bob and Lynn took it upon themselves to try and negotiate an obscene amount of money for the album and Riker Hill stood firm at their offer, which coincided with what was in our contracts. We also found out that Riker was losing a lot of money, mainly on the large salaries that Bob and Lynn were making. Riker wanted to essentially fire Bob so they didn't have to pay his large salary anymore. Again, years later, the head of the label told me that Bob was basically doing nothing at the label and was a waste of money to keep on. I believe this triggered the bad blood between Riker Hill and our managers. Talk about a conflict of interest. That's why we were always kept away from talking to anyone at Riker Hill. Bob and Lynn assured us to just lay out the recording costs and that Riker Hill was in breach of contract and that we would be getting a new, bigger deal with a major label. I feverishly protested. I had just paid Paulie and Dave back almost $40,000 for fronting the first album and touring cost up until we got Xerox. I was not about to go into debt again on Bob and Lynn's word, especially since Bob and Lynn never laid out one single dime from their own pockets for anything. Paulie and Dave listened to whatever Bob and Lynn said and decided they would once again put all of the album's costs on their credit cards. They never even questioned them about why. On top of that, Bob had the balls to approach us with another producer contract that had us paying him another $10,000 to produce Casino Logic. This is where I started to lose my mind. I remember telling Paulie and Dave, if they are expecting us to blindly front the cost of the album without any real explanation as to why our label, whom they were COOs at, weren't paying for it, then Bob and Lynn should pay for a big chunk of the album themselves. Bob should only get his producer fee if we get the record funded down the line, not up front. This became a big battle. Paulie and Dave couldn't understand why I thought Bob and Lynn should help pay for the album. I tried to explain, Bob and Lynn aren't telling us exactly why Riker Hill is refusing to pay and they also have as much to gain as we do especially Bob, who is co-writer on every single song. By no means was I saying that Bob and Lynn should pay for the whole album, but if they were asking us in good faith to trust them, I thought they should take some of the risk also. Of course, I was outvoted again. The one and only thing that Paulie and Dave agreed with me about was Bob's $10,000 producer fee. We agreed that if Bob wanted to produce the album, then he would only get his producer fee if and when we got an advance for the album from either Riker Hill or another record label. After a lot of arguing, 
Bob eventually agreed to these terms, even though years later he would try to sue us for that exact $10,000 producer fee. Sad. Here's one of my favorite songs off Casino Logic called Hero. Just to paint the picture for everyone, Bob and Lynn were our managers, but both also got salaries as the COOs of our now estranged record label, Riker Hill Records. They were also both getting paid as executive producers on Xerox, getting two-fifths of our Xerox money and taking an additional 20% managerial cut of all the money we were getting paid. On top of that, Bob now wanted his producer fee of $10,000, which he wanted us to personally lay out. All of this smelled really bad to me. It wouldn't be until the end of season two of Xerox that I would finally be able to put all the pieces together. In December 2008, right before we began filming season two of Xerox, ZO2 had two shows with Twisted Sister at the Nokia Theater in Times Square, New York. Twisted was always one of my favorite bands growing up, and it was such a great experience playing with them in our hometown. Of course, Twisted still had a huge following, but coming off the success of Season 1 of Z-Rock, ZO2 also had a pretty big crowd during these Nokia theater shows. Between this and the Kiss show we had just played in Tahoe, 
we really began to feel the impact Z-Rock was having. These shows were also very special because we had become really close friends with all the guys in Twisted Sister. JJ had been in the original unaired Z-Rock pilot, D was in one of the most popular episodes from season one, and was also said to appear along with guitarist Eddie Ojeda in the first episode of season two. We had been guests on Mark the Animal Mendoza's radio show numerous times, and we were very friendly with drummer AJ Perot. Bob had been friends with JJ for a long time, and we always thought he was very friendly with the other guys as well. Years later, we attended the 30th anniversary of Twisted Sister's landmark album, Stay Hungry, and we found out that Mark and AJ actually detested Bob. And Dee did as well, to some extent. Mendoza would always fool around with us and say that he was going to kick our ass or beat the crap out of us. It was kind of his way of playing. On the night of the 30th anniversary, he asked us where our asshole manager was. <laughs> we all started to laugh as always. He then got really serious and said, No, I mean it. I don't want to see that jerk off here tonight. Paulie replied, Wait, are you being serious? That's when Mendoza and AJ began to tell us all about how they really hated Bob for many years and just could never say anything because he was such good friends with JJ. We couldn't believe it. I was starting to hear this type of stuff about Bob more and more frequently from all sides. I wouldn't have changed a thing up until this point, but I couldn't help but notice all of the things that were going on around me. Something wasn't right. Right after the Twisted shows in 2009, Paulie, Dave, and I took our annual trip to Los Angeles for the NAM Music Convention and another appearance at the TCA Convention to promote Z-Rock. I had just gotten a new rep at Ludwig, Victor Salazar, who was a huge fan of the show. Victor called me right before our trip to NAM to introduce himself and to ask me if there's anything I needed from Ludwig for Xerox Season 2. Even though I had just recently received a brand new Champagne Sparkle kit from Ludwig, I mentioned that I was thinking about getting a new kit for Season 2. Never in a million years did I think he would say yes, but I figured, what do I have to lose? Victor immediately responded and said, Yes, absolutely. What did you have in mind? This caught me totally off guard, but luckily, I knew the Ludwig new catalog like the back of my hand and responded, I was thinking either a red sparkle or an amber vista light. Victor quickly responded, Why not both? The perks of Xerox were unbelievable. Upon our arrival at NAM, we were absolutely bombarded. Anyone and everyone knew who we were. As big of a hit as we thought Xerox was, in the music community, it was almost a phenomenon. Nam was filled with musicians who could really relate to everything that we did in the show. Driving in a van with all of our gear, arguing, crappy gigs, and getting screwed over. It was all relatable to this demographic, and they certainly let us know it. We couldn't walk 10 feet without someone stopping us for a picture and an autograph, or just to tell us how much they love Xerox. I also found out that Ludwig was honoring me by including me on their 100th anniversary banner. They placed me right in between two of my favorite drummers of all time, Eric Carr of Kiss and John Bonham of Led Zeppelin. I was blown away. Ludwig had scheduled me to do a signing with some of the artists on their roster. I, of course, was thrilled and honored to be a part of something like this. But I didn't really think anyone would care about me when guys like Alan White from Yes, Dave Lombardo from Slayer, and Jason Bonham, the late great John Bonham's son, were standing next to me. Boy, was I wrong. Once the signing began, almost every person in line not only knew me, but said it was one of the main reasons they waited on line. It got so nuts at one point that Jason Bonham who had no idea who I was, asked me, Who do you play with again? Everyone seems to love you. I told him I was on a TV show called Z-Rock. He said, I'm going to have to check that out. Life was about to get even better. One evening after Nam, while we were having dinner, I got a call from Madeline that would forever change my life. Madeline said, I think that the pregnancy test I just took said pregnant. I began yelling, 
What do you mean you think? A few months prior, Madeline and I had decided that we wanted to try and have a baby. We couldn't wait to start our family and this could be the beginning. Madeline replied by yelling, I can't read the little symbol that says positive or negative on the test perfectly. I told her to run to the store and get one of the tests that say yes or no on them. About 30 minutes later, she texted me a picture with the test that said yes. I was the happiest man on the earth. I couldn't believe I was going to be a dad. I wanted to shout the good news as loud as I could, but we decided to wait until Madeline was further along to tell everyone. Once I returned from L.A., Madeline and I celebrated and were excited beyond belief. But it would be a few months before we could find out if it was a boy or a girl. In the meantime, I began filming the second season of z -Rock. Still, filming the second season was nothing compared to the joy and excitement I was feeling. I was going to be a dad. The success of the first season of z -Rock was unexpected. When we began filming season one, we really had no expectations and didn't really even care that much about the storylines. Season 2 started off completely different. Now that ZO2 was a bona fide hit show, expectations were very high. We knew we had to make Season 2 even better than Season 1. The first day of filming Season 2 was a blast. It was so good to see everyone again and begin working. The very last scene of the first day was scheduled to be a fight between me and Harry Bronstein, played by comedian Greg Giraldo. In the script, my girlfriend Becky, who I hadn't seen in months, shows up at a party where we were playing and kisses Greg's character, Harry Bronstein. The scene was pretty simple. I had to throw a couple of fake punches and then he was going to tackle me. Easy enough, right? Wrong. After Greg and I did all the hard moves, Paulie and Dave were supposed to lift me off of him to break up the fight. As I was getting up, my boots slid on the floor tile and my whole knee twisted and the whole room heard a loud pop. I screamed, not only from the pain, but from the horror of knowing what had just happened. I had torn the ACL in my left knee. What, Becky? What are you doing here? Hi, um, I'm here to see my boyfriend. What do you mean? What are you, what are you talking about? Oh, hey, hey how, are how are you? Whoa! Joey, what are you doing? I'll kill you, please, come on! Oh, take let's it go. easy! Yeah, take your Just jacket sir. off, you, you coked up reason. Let's go! Really? <laughs> <laughs> I was devastated. I went straight to the ER where they scheduled me for an MRI early the next morning. The results confirmed what I already knew. Torn ACL and torn meniscus in my left knee. This was only our first day of filming. What the hell was I going to do? Even though I was one of the stars of the show, they couldn't wait for me to have surgery and heal to begin filming again. That would have taken months. I did what I always did. I picked myself up and pressed forward. I decided I would hold off on surgery until mid-season so we could figure out a way to actually write it into the script. In the meantime, I would just hobble around the set and figure out a way to get all of my scenes done. I was back on set the next morning. I also played a ZO2 show with one leg just three days later. Let's see a sports star or movie star tear their ACL and go back to work the next day. Never happen. I wasn't going to let anything stop me. After tearing my ACL, we decided that we actually needed one more song recorded for the album. None of us thought we really had a hit single yet, so Paulie wrote another song with Chris Barron from the Spin Doctors called Painted Lady. I wind up tracking it with my torn ACL.
she do me no good She's got a finger on the button And you know she When I told the producers my plan, they couldn't believe that I planned not only to keep filming, but also to not compromise even one shot. Anything they needed me to do, I figured out a way to do it. When I arrived on set the next morning, my knee looked five times its normal size from the trauma and the swelling. The first scene we shot was when Neil comes to visit me at my new nursing job. The scene took about three hours to shoot, and I was standing the whole time. Needless to say, Season 2 was off to a rough start for me. Even though I was injured, I was super excited about this second season. The scripts were calling for much more character development for me, Dave, and Pauly. Because IFC was looking to become an ad-based channel, basically all that meant was ad commercials, it was also trying to clean Xerox up a little. We didn't have any more nudity and focused more on actual funny storytelling rather than shock value. Some people will say this hurt the show and made it less rock and roll, but I thought the show became stronger. In a weird way, me being injured actually led to a lot of funny little changes in the scripts. For instance, in episode two, Paulie and I were supposed to bring our dates to the ice skating rink and skate with them. Obviously, I couldn't skate with a torn ACL, so we changed it to me standing on the side while my date, Bethany Frankel, from the Real Housewives of New York, fed me hot dogs while I made fun of Pauly skating. The scene ended when I bribed a little fat kid on the ice with a bacon-wrapped hot dog to check Pauly over the boards. It became an instant classic. Come to daddy. Just a little bite, a little bite, a little. Oh, oh. One for you, two for me. Who the hell ever thought of putting bacon on a hot dog? Goddamn. Freak show! Oh my God, look what at this. What are you doing over there? Come on, freak, I'll help you. Look at that, leaving you in the dust. What are you doing? There's no dust, it's ice, my Come friend. Come on, I'll help you. You you're a loser, look at me. You, you know, you look good, freak. Oh, oh, oh. Yo, kid, come here. See that goofy bastard down there with the afro? I'll give you a hot dog if you knock him over. They're wrapped in bacon. Boom. Bonnie, look. Paulie Gretzky, baby. One morning at the beginning of filming episode 3, I arrived on set and thought I was in some kind of weird alternate reality world. It was about 6.30 a.m. and as I walked in, I had to stop at the doorway and take in what I was witnessing. I saw Frank Stallone, yes, Sylvester Stallone's brother, with a guitar and a small amplifier strapped to his belt. He was singing his big hit, Take You Back from Rocky. While Frank was roaming around by himself singing, Mini Kiss, a group of little people that dressed like Kiss, were running around the room at top speed for some unknown reason. Mind you, filming for the day had not yet even begun. This was just happening while everyone was arriving on set that morning. All I could think of was who the hell has a better job than me? Here's a really fun clip of us singing Take You Back with Frank Stallone. Hey, I don't call it a Tuesday. All right, hey, that's good. We got it. I could use you guys in 1983. (laughs) This was one really fun episode to film in general. 
Paulie and Dave would always tease me that I looked like Frank Stallone. The joke was always that I wasn't handsome enough to look like his brother, Sylvester Stallone. People would always ask me, who is the craziest rock star or comedian you guys filmed with? To everyone's surprise, my answer would always be the same, Frank Stallone. Season 2 also had two of my favorite all-time episodes, Jailhouse Z-Rock and Z-Wrestler. Season 1 had a great underlying storyline connecting the entire season. For Season 2, though, IFC wanted more standalone episodes because they would work better as reruns. Jailhouse Z-Rock brought us back to the hometown of Jay Okerson's character, Neil. In the episode, Z02 was scheduled to play a show with Poison singer Brett Michaels in Connecticut. On the way to the show, we made a pit stop through Neil's hometown where hilarity ensued. One of my all-time favorite scenes was when I had to distract a priest by giving him my confession. The actor who played the priest, David Martin, was very stiff and it was very hard to get any lines out of him. I was so completely comfortable acting and in front of the camera at this point that I just took control of the scene. I remember hearing the whole crew laughing and causing us to lose some really funny takes. There are a lot of great bloopers from that scene. I'm not fucking nuts. This place ruined my life. Stop him. I'll stall this guy. Stop it. Father, father, father. Hold on. I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you, father, please. I got to unburden my soul, father, please. In, in, get in. Get in there. Get in there. What's happening here? May I help you? Yes, Father, I, I, I need to confess. I need Come to get some things off my chest, Father. Come in and sit down. Oh, thank you. Whoa, look at this. This is beautiful. Thank you. Wow. Oh, my God. Uh, where's Jesus? What do you mean, where is Jesus? You know, the body, the blood, the crown of thorns, the Jesus I know and love. We celebrate the risen Christ, son. Oh, that's good, because the bloody one scares the hell out of me. <laughs> What's your religious belief? Oh, I'm Catholic, Father, of course. Roman Catholic, that is. No, not Roman. I'm from Sicily. <laughs> Never mind. <clears throat> anyway, tell me what your problems are, son. Well, first, I just broke up with my girlfriend, Becky. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about Becky. Whoa, father. We're going to be all right for the rest of the day, but don't mention that name ever again, please. Anyway, you know, sometimes when I'm home now, I choke up on the bat a little bit, you know what I mean? I don't understand. I don't know how to put this so you can understand. You know, I, I lay my hands upon myself until, you know, until I'm fully anointed. That's normal for a young, healthy man. No, you don't understand. I don't want to do it. But the problem is, I go down to Gristiti's, right? I get myself a little walk around pork. And the girl at the counter, she scoops up the potato salad. She bends over. Father, she's built like a beast. You know what I'm trying to say? I think you'll be all right. <clears throat> oh, no, father, father. I have more. I have more. I'm a wrestling fan. Yes. So at the end of the month, they have these pay-per-views. And my cousin Charlie hooked me up with this box. And I get the pay-per-views for free now. You're not stealing, are you? Uh, I'm not stealing. Charlie stole the box, but he gave it to me as a gift, so I don't really consider that stealing. So what's the problem then? No, no, Father, please, sit, sit, sit. I got plenty more. You're a very good boy, and I think what you just have to do is relax, and all these things will take care of themselves in due time. What, should I say some Hail Marys? We don't say Hail Marys here, but if that's what you'd like... That's my favorite. How many would you like to say? Say five, ten? I mean, the Gracidis girl alone deserves ten. I think at least twelve, thirteen, right? Say twelve, and even dozen. I don't know if this is going to be insulting to you, but I'm Italian. I got to I gotta express myself the way we do it. You know what I mean? Come here. Lean, I got to lean for the real thing. You know what I'm saying? Oh, oh thank you, Father, sir. thank you so much. Thank you, Father. I, I feel really better already. Come back any time. I'll be very happy to talk to you again. Thank you, Father. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. By the way, Mary, I love what you're doing with this Episcopalian thing. It's phenomenal. My favorite all-time blooper, which actually made it into the episode, was when Neil hit the priest with the egg. When we shot that scene, Mohammed from the props department was standing about three feet from the priest. He was supposed to lightly hit the priest in the chest with the egg. Instead, Mohammed wound up like he was Roger Clemens and nailed him directly in the face. <laughs> the whole crew and cast were in shock. As soon as the director yelled cut, the priest looked at Muhammad with a disgusted look and said, I guess you missed. I remember hiding behind a tree with one of the head executives of IFC and crying with laughter. The set was so much fun every single day. 
We were having the time of our lives. The end of the episode was supposed to have us hand deliver a specially requested soup to Brett Michaels. We were all scheduled to film one night when ZO2 actually played with Brett at Mulcahy's in Long Island on March 19th, 2009. Brett had been in touch with our producers and was excited to be on the show. We arrived to Mulcahy's with the whole z crew to film the scene. For some reason, however, Brett decided he didn't want to get off his tour bus. This really surprised us. Not only was Brett really cool to us during the whole Kiss Poison tour, but we had just hung out with him the night before and were talking about filming. This was one of my first real dealings with someone famous throwing a little bit of a diva fit. Besides the incident with Vince Neil in San Francisco, of course. Brett just got it in his head that night that he no longer wanted to film. He told our producers that he was a little bit under the weather and wanted to rest. Not only was this hurting the final scene of the episode, but we just wasted thousands of dollars because the whole Z-Rock crew was there ready to film. Luckily, Gottlieb quickly rewrote the scene on the fly, and we instead had Pauly chasing after Brett's tour bus with the soup. I never looked at Brett the same way after he screwed us over that night. Writing our scenes for season two was much different than season one. I had become very friendly with the head writer, Andrew Gottlieb, and his assistant writer, Sam Brenner. Dave and I would play poker with them on set for hours every day in between takes. During those hours, we would always discuss scripts and ideas, and of course tell jokes. This meant I end up having a much larger impact on not only my character, but the show in general. One early morning, while we were getting ready to film the pre-scene in Jailhouse Z-Rock, Gottlieb, producer Mark Effman, and I were playing poker and discussing an upcoming episode. Everyone knew that I loved professional wrestling. Effman said that they were planning on a wrestling-themed episode where Paulie, Dave, and I dressed as 80s wrestlers like Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man. He also mentioned that they were in talks with Ric Flair to be the celebrity guest for that episode. Of course, I was immediately excited about the possibility of not only working with a legend like Ric Flair, but about filming a whole episode dedicated to one of my favorite things in the world, wrestling. But I had a much better idea than dressing like 80s wrestlers. I suggested to Gottlieb and Effman that Paulie, Dave, and I dress as our original wrestling characters. Effman said, What do you mean original? I went on to explain that I'd been doing my Joey-licious wrestling character for years. They loved the idea, and that's how the Joey-licious episode of Z-Rock was born. We found out shortly after that Ric Flair couldn't do the episode due to a scheduling conflict but the producers had secured another famous wrestler, Chris Jericho, as the guest star. I was definitely disappointed that I wasn't going to work with Flair. He had always been one of my all-time favorite wrestlers growing up. Of course, I knew Jericho, but he was definitely from more of the newer class of wrestlers. I always liked him in WCW and thought his promos were awesome. The weekend before we filmed Z-Wrestler, we all headed back to L.A. for the Spirit Awards that aired on IFC every year. This was our first experience being part of an award show, and we were pretty excited. Because the Spirit Awards were on IFC and Xerox was their flagship show, Paulie, Dave, and I were asked to present an award at the show that night. Once we got to L.A., we received the red carpet treatment all weekend. This was the first time that I really felt like a bona fide celebrity. I had never thought of us like that. But now that Xerox was a hit, and we were going to not only be mingling with Hollywood A-listers, but on stage in front of them presenting an award, we felt like we belonged. The day before the award show, we had a run-through of what we were supposed to do when presenting. We each had a few lines to read from the teleprompter. The only problem was that the lines were really straight, not funny, and just not us. We had dinner and drinks with everyone from IFC that night, and we were telling the president of IFC, Evan Shapiro, that we didn't love what they had written for us to say on the award show. He said, then don't say it. 
write something else. We said, are we allowed to do that? He went on to tell us that IFC asked you three to present an award to show off your unique personalities and to tell the world about Xerox. Be yourselves and come up with a little bit that will leave people saying, I have to see their show. We all agreed and knew the exact bit that we were going to use. When we arrived at the Spirit Awards, we were immediately greeted by our guide for the day. She ushered us through the red carpet to greet the press and take hundreds of photos. Each celebrity had their own guide that would steer them in the right direction through the press and event activities. It was an amazing experience. I've seen dozens of red carpet shows on TV and always wondered what it would be like to actually walk one. Dozens of photographers were screaming out names to get stars to look at them so they could get the best shot. This worked great when they were trying to get a picture of one celebrity, but in our case, there was three of us. So I don't think there's one picture where all of us are looking in the same direction. Idiots. After the red carpet, they guided us to the swag tent. We had no idea what a swag tent was, but we were eager to find out. Once inside, we saw dozens of stations showcasing all sorts of different products. Anything from toothpaste to new smartphones to vacations. Our guide explained, just go to each station and sign up for anything you want. We still weren't sure what she meant exactly. We asked, what do you mean sign up? She further explained, kind of joyously, because she had realized we'd never done this before. Everything and anything in here is free. We ran into the room like kids on a Toys R Us shopping spree. It was so weird seeing Elaine from Seinfeld standing next to me signing up for free toothpaste. It made no sense. These millionaire celebrities didn't need free things, yet each and every one of them were in the room with us, each getting as much stuff as possible. <laughs> it was a fun experience. After the swag tent, we were taken to our table. Because IFC ran the whole show, our table was right against the stage, dead center. Basically the featured table of the night. All other tables were slightly behind us. Seeing people like Alec Baldwin, Jessica Alba, and Mickey Rock sitting behind us was really quite extraordinary. After watching the awards for a little bit, we were escorted backstage to get ready to present the award in the Best Cinematography category. After doing a few minutes of press, we started to get ready in the dressing room alongside Christina Applegate, who was very sweet and nice to us. Paulie looked like a lovesick puppy when he met her, since he was a giant Married with Children fan, and he had a crush on her since he was a little kid. As we made our way to the stairs and up to the stage, I told the other guys not to walk too fast because I still had a pretty bad limp from my ACL. As we started to go over our routine, who stood behind us but Cameron Diaz? She was to present right after us. She laughed at our bit and told us, don't be nervous guys, I love it and you will do great. She was super sweet and friendly, but also extremely skinny in person. We heard the host, comedian Stephen Cohan, announce, from the hit TV show, Z-Rock, here they are, ZO2. We came out from behind the curtain to a mild applause, except for a screaming Eric Roberts, the star of one of my all-time favorite movies, The Pulp of Greenwich Village. Apparently, he was a big Z-Rock fan. We were all set to go into our newly scripted routine. Paulie, Dave, and I had prepared something that actually happened in real life. Just like most of our Xerox scripts, even our award show presentation for Best Cinematography was based on real life. The bit went something like this. When you think of cinematography, you think of our next presenters from the IFC hit comedy series Z-Rock. Please welcome the band Z-O2. I'm David. I'm Joey. And I'm Paulie, and we are here to present the award for best choreography. Choreography? Did you just say that? Yes. Dude. Cinematography. <laughs> say it with me. Cinematography. Okay. Cinematography, choreography, doesn't matter. The point is mute. 
Mute? The word is moot, stupid. You should be mute. Obviously, being musicians, we never really understood what cinematography was, but now that we have our own TV show, I think we're getting a handle on it. By the way, did he mention we have our own TV show on the Independent Film Channel? So, um, thank you, thank you. Keep it up. So, uh, ladies in the, uh, in the audience, just you might want to keep that in mind. <laughs> thank you. Uh, continue. So, the nominees for Best Cinematography are... Maurice Alberti, The Wrestler. Lowell Crawley, Ballast. James Laxton, Medicine for Melancholy. Harris Savides, Milk. Michael Simmons, Chop Shop. Spirit Award goes to... Maurice Alberti, The Wrestler! <laughs> this was taken straight from an actual conversation that Paulie had with Gene Simmons years prior on the Kiss Tour. The bit got a huge laugh, and we got to present the award for Best Cinematography to the movie The Wrestler. Overall, it was a perfect night that I will remember forever. At the after party, I even got into a pretty heated argument with Buffy the Vampire Slayer star Eliza Dushku. It turns out Elijah was a big Boston Red Sox fan, and I was obviously a big New York Yankees fan. We had a friendly argument about who was the better team. I obviously won that discussion. After the Spirit Awards, we still had one more night in L.A. with everyone from IFC. They planned a small dinner and get-together to celebrate our success at the Spirit Awards. They all seemed proud of us and thought we came across very funny Natural, and of course, ridiculous. Exactly what they wanted. Even though they weren't invited, and IFC actually didn't want them there, Bob and Lynn came along for the whole trip. It was as if they didn't want us to be alone around the network, the producers, or our label. Curious. Midway through dinner, Bob got an interesting and exciting call. It was from the now head of A&R at Universal Records, Jason Flom. Earlier in the book, if you remember, I talked about Flom, who was once the head of A&R at Atlantic Records, and my former band, Exposed, was trying desperately to get him to sign us, only to be told we were two 80s. It turns out that Flom had been a massive fan of Z-Rock and wanted to sit down and talk with us. Even though the dinner that IFC was having was mainly in our honor, we couldn't pass up an opportunity to sit down with the one and only Jason Flom. We met him at a small place in Beverly Hills. He greeted us like he knew us, and in a way, he did, from Z-Rock. He was nice and we talked for around two hours about everything and anything. Jason wasn't a big drinker, so we all decided to have giant milkshakes during the meeting. I'm sure this was quite a ways off from when he used to have meetings with bands like Twisted Sister or Skid Row back in the day. We played it cool and never really talked business with him. It felt like he was trying to feel us out. I guess we felt pretty good because Bob got a call the next day before we left for the airport that Jason had a great idea about him appearing on Xerox and really signing us to a record contract on the air during the episode. If the Spirit Awards appearance had us flying high, this sent us into outer space. Once we returned to New York, we received an invite from Joan Rivers to guest star with her on NBC's Celebrity Apprentice. Joan was doing a challenge against the other contestants, and we appeared on the show with her to help sell cupcakes. It was a fun experience. The day after filming The Apprentice, it was time to get back to filming Z-Rock. Filming the episode Z-Wrestler was one of the best moments of Z-Rock for me. Not only did it really showcase me, but it also let me play my alter ego I've been wanting to be since I first saw wrestling come on TV that fateful Saturday morning back in 1983. The world would now finally be introduced to Joey Licious. As soon as Chris Jericho came onto the set, we knew it was going to be a fun week of filming. 
he pre-immediately made fun of us to break the ice. The three of us, who were now all dressed as our wrestling alter egos, pulled Pork Pauly, Chip and Dave, and Joey Licious, greeted Jericho, and he started laughing at us. He said, why the hell are you guys wearing cups? Pauly quickly responded, why, wrestlers don't wear cups? Jericho laughed even harder. No, we don't wear cups. Dave chimed in. Then how do you protect your nuts? Jericho, still laughing, replied, Wow, you guys are exactly like you are on the show. It was the perfect way to break the ice. It turned out that Jericho was a big fan of Xerox Season 1 and was thrilled to be on the show. Chris was hysterical and an absolute joy to work with. Here's a great clip from Xerox that actually never made the show. It's Paulie, Dave, and I introducing our wrestling characters. Let me tell you right now, I don't care if we were the biggest rock stars in the world, this is what I want to do. Right here, baby. I've always wanted to be Joey Licious, the Italian dream, baby! <laughs> the world heavyweight champion, right here. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I guess you're right. Are you crazy? <laughs> we do I am the we man of the too. hour, the tower of power, too sweet to be sour. <laughs> We oh do. my god, how long did you practice that? What do you oh. practice? I've been practicing since I'm five, what do you mean? He's been dying for the day where he can say you? those moves. Dude, come on, you can't tell from the bow tie? Cascadilla? No! Chip and Dave, baby! Oh. Like the Disney cartoon? Chip and Dale, no, Rescue no, Rangers? No, not Chip and Dale. Chip and Dave, baby! The women love me, the men want to be me. Oh my god, what's your move? Dude, I'm, I'm taking a whole new outlook on the pile driver. It's called the pump and dump. Swirl around a little and boop! Dump them, right on their head. Did you think this out? You know you're oh, wrestling like dudes, right? Yeah, but... Swirl around and then you're gonna dump on the dude. That's good. I might need a new move. That's an okay move, but it's nothing on mine, baby. It's got nothing oh. on mine. You ready? The python comes up, and then the garlic knot comes oh, down, baby! Oh, oh, God. God. The garlic yeah. knot! I smell Woo. it from here, are you crazy? <laughs> oh. You know I'm filled with Sicilian love juice. My love oil makes me slip out of any move, baby. I cannot be pinned. Woo! What about you? Yeah, what is this? Dude, <laughs> I'm pulled pork poly, baby. Triple P. Triple P? Triple P. What's your move? Well, I have three things that I do, okay? I have the appetizer. It's a pigs in a blanket. I wrap them up in my cape so that they can't move. And then I got the entree. It's called the pork belly. And what I do is I grab their stomachs and I Pull the pork right out of them. And then they just drop to the floor. And then the dessert is I pour barbecue sauce all over them. Please don't tell me you eat it. No, not me. My mascot, brisket. Your mascot? What? Is that a pig? Yeah. And his name is brisket. Yep. <laughs> brisket <laughs> is beef, you mop. I know. What's wrong with you? Hey, just name him Lamb Chop. Lamb Chop? For a... <laughs> That's not a pig's name. Are you an idiot? The episode was directed by Brad Hall from Saturday Night Live fame and husband of Seinfeld's Elaine, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Z Wrestler was filmed with so many bloopers and laughs behind the scenes that it was easily my favorite episode. The scene when I first see Chris Jericho at the birthday party was completely improv by me. The idea was for me to get super excited because my character was a big wrestling fan and an even bigger Chris Jericho fan. I took it to the next level. Up until this point in Xerox, it could be said that I played the most normal character. I was more of the cool Italian drummer, while Paulie and Dave were goofier and more childish. That was about to change. When my eyes first saw Chris Jericho entering the room, I started to scream like a little girl at a Backstreet Boys concert in 1999. I began jumping up and down, clapping and practically weeping. We got everything and more that we needed on the very first take. When Brad Hall called cut on that first take, the whole room absolutely exploded with laughter. No one was ready for, nor could they believe my over-the-top hysteria. They loved it. After the scene, Brad told me that it was one of the funniest things he'd ever seen. That's a pretty big compliment coming from someone who starred on Saturday Night Live. Chris Jericho! Yeah! 
I've never, ever seen you act like this. You know how much I love the Yankees? Yes. You know how much I love the Pope? Yes. Uh -huh. Times that by 50, there's my love for Chris Jericho. What am I supposed to do? The heart wants what it wants. I'm looking at him right now. He's right there. And what's your name, little guy? Actually, I was next. I was next. He's beautiful. <laughs> no. Chris, Chris, Chris. Whoa, man, was that, that was awesome. You really brought the violence to that song, man. Listen, I don't need to take advice from the drummer in a kid's band, OK? Whoa, whoa. You don't even have a drum set. I'm sorry if a Canadian couldn't understand how I was talking. Maybe I should say it in French. I'll lock kick your ass. You want a fracas? Yeah, you want to throw hands? Let's go. Boy, you're going to hit me with that schnoz? It's like Come a on. plantain stuck in the middle of your face. Grandfather's you watch. Joey, I don't want to get on, blood on that. You want to bring the body yeah, to show you some violence? Violence isn't supposed to end like this. <laughs> it's the perfect example of turning a negative into a positive. When I tore my ACL, I could have easily gotten down and took off a few episodes of Z Rock. Instead, I fought through the pain and discomfort on set and wound up filming, in my and many others' opinions, one of the best episodes of Z Rock ever. The day after filming Z Wrestler, I had surgery to repair my torn ACL. They used a cadaver's ACL. That's a dead body for anyone who doesn't know. The plan was for Xerox to halt production for one week, then resume as planned. The opening of the next episode, Z My Baby, showed Paulie and Dave picking me up from the hospital. In the episode, I explained my injury like this. How could you possibly let this happen? I was going down to Faiko's, my weekly pork pickup. There's a piece of super sod hanging from the ceiling on a hook. I couldn't reach it. I took two cans of olive oil, I stacked them up, stood on it, boom! Wiped right out. It's so irresponsible! No, it's actually a very common Italian injury. <laughs> the episode was filled with guest stars galore, including NFL Hall of Famer Warren Sapp, rock DJ Eddie Trunk, and the band Steel Panther, who we would face off against in the Battle of the Bands. I spent the whole episode confined to a wheelchair, and ZO2 had Warren Sapp fill in on drums. <laughs> Crazy. Somehow, even me having surgery worked out. Me being in the wheelchair made us come up with some funny, crazy ideas for storylines, and they worked perfectly. For anyone out there that has had ACL replacement surgery, you know for the first few weeks you are in excruciating pain, completely immobile, and need of extensive rehab to get back into walking shape. But I fought through all of that, filmed on the set of Xerox every day for 16 hours, and instead of taking a lunch break, I would spend an hour at rehab. I'm not sure anyone, the producers, the network, our managers, Paulie or Dave ever realized how hard it was for me to do that every day. I never complained or made any issue of it. Whatever they needed me to do, I figured out a way to do it.